This is The Saucer Life, exploring the history and lore of flying saucers. I'm Aaron Gullius. The Saucer Life is a podcast in which we explore concepts, events, or people from the world of flying saucers. No preconceptions, no snark, no belief, no debunking, no FBI informants. This is Encounter 206, and then the feds showed up. This episode has a strange journey. It uh, started off as part of Encounter 204, the second part of our big journey through 1954. Then, as that episode got too big, it was going to be a bonus encounter. Then I found some more stuff, and then I went down a rabbit hole or two, and it just ballooned from there. The Detroit Flying Saucer Club turned out to be way more interesting than I ever thought it would be while flipping through the first issue of Vimana, or rather, to be correct, Vinama. This week, we're going to look at the Detroit Flying Saucer Club through the eyes of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, and along the way, meet one of the much less well-known figures from the classic contactee era of ufology. If you haven't listened to Encounters 203 and 204, those are good companions to this episode, and they'll give you a little context into what was going on in the mid-50s. But if you haven't heard those yet, don't worry. All of this is also something of a cautionary tale about the strange connections in the saucer world and where those can take you if you're not careful. And even though this was just going to be a bit of an extra addition to Encounter 204, it ended up being longer and more complex than I was expecting when I started out. So, let's climb aboard our Vimana and get... In late 1954, around the same time as the first issues of Vimana were coming out, the Detroit office of the FBI was receiving some information about the Detroit Flying Saucer Club. We'll begin with a report filed on November 30th, 1954. Please note that some of the names of informants are still redacted. The purpose of this letter is to set out for the information of the Bureau the activities of the Detroit Flying Saucer Club, as they are known. This is done chronologically. On May 18th, 1954, Mrs. advised that she had been attending meetings concerning flying saucers, rockets to the moon, etc., which she felt could be subversive. On May 27, 1954, and of Detroit advised that one George Adamski had talked to Detroit on flying saucers. They were alarmed at the nature of the remarks, such as, we are Americans, but, and that we should reduce our arms and would blow ourselves up with the H-bomb because visitors from outer space were afraid we had started something that we would let get out of hand. As researchers and writers like Nick Redfern have pointed out in books about government investigation of flying saucer clubs and researchers, a lot of the evidence we have is that when organizations like the FBI scrutinized the saucer scene, it usually was because of issues like this. Someone involved in an organization thinks someone else involved in an organization may be up to no good. Like we saw in our episodes on the zine scene in the 50s, There was certainly a fear in some quarters that communist infiltration might be affecting flying saucer organizations. But sometimes the definition of subversive political beliefs got a little looser and wider than we might expect. On July 13, 1954, advised that was bringing to Detroit someone who had talked to people from Venus, Clarion, etc., who are more highly advanced than Earth people. They advocated the golden rule as the only workable rule. A meeting was to be held on July 15, 1954. Also furnished a letter from one encouraging him and his interest in flying saucers. Felt such an organization could use the flying saucer scare as political propaganda. He said they opposed the atomic bomb and warfare. Advised she attended the July 15, 1954 meeting of the flying saucer group. The purpose was to organize a flying saucer club in Detroit. Was behind it. She said she first met him when he came into the store to buy books on flying saucers. An organizational letter was passed out at the meeting stating the purpose of the Flying Saucer Club of Detroit. The purpose was, one, exchange ideas and in general become aware of the flying saucer picture. Two, invite national saucer speakers to Detroit and enlighten the public. Three, spread information on flying saucers. Four, engage in those aspects of saucer interests especially appealing to each member, such as astronomy, engineering, spiritual, curiosity, etc. You know, there's no actual communism here. And to be clear and fair, the FBI isn't saying there is. But it's interesting to me that those who contacted the FBI thought that such ideas as adhering to the golden rule and opposing warfare were subversive enough to squeal to the feds. 
The goals of the club don't seem to be any stranger uh, than those of any other standard municipal flying saucer club of the time. What's presented in this report also seems to be along the lines of the goals the club outlined in the first issue of Vimana. But there's something and someone else going on here, and this is where I ended up going down one of the rabbit holes I was talking about. I didn't mention it a couple years ago because I didn't realize the significance, but there was an officer of the Detroit Flying Saucer Club named Laura Markser who was resigning from the DFSC to work with another club and undertake some saucer outreach might be the best way to put it. After reading about her in these FBI papers, I threw her name into my Google machine and found out that she was more commonly known by her maiden name, Laura Mundo, and that was a name that rang some bells. I looked at my, by this time, very well-worn copy of Jim Mosley's autobiography. It mentioned that Mundo was a supporter of George Adamski and had composed some UFO pamphlets back in the day that had been published by Gray Barker in the 1950s and 1960s. So what's the deal with Laura Mundo, or Markser, as the case may be? Well, according to one informant to the FBI, she had a slightly different vision for the Detroit Flying Saucer Club. On October 13th, 1954, said that asked him to call a meeting October 18th, 1954. At this time, he said he felt he knew less about the club than anyone, but he thought it would make a good cover for subversive activities. He was advised that the object of group discussions, according to Markser, was 1. To indoctrinate people to receive space people. 2. Mass landings in Detroit in October. No further information explained. 3. A saucer landed at 4.30 a.m. September 30th, 1954 at Rotunda Drive in Southfield in Detroit with strange greenish men in brown uniforms. 4. Unseen Psychic Forces indoctrination is a pretty scary term in 1954. Uh, heck, it, it makes me kind of leery here in 2017. And there were other issues as well at subsequent meetings of the Detroit Flying Saucer Club. At the October 18th, 1954 meeting, a group leader from Detroit said that opposed group meetings because of accusations against them of subversive activities. An unidentified person said he did not think it was true, but it was alleged one member of the board of directors was a communist. Answered this by saying he would mention no names, but the accuser should see him about this, and the accused was not a communist. He said fellow travelers could get in or infiltrate the club, but he was at a loss as to any way of controlling that. As a result of this meeting, felt the group was either subversive or a new religious group. He felt it all stems from Adamski in California. It's like a staging of the crucible in there, isn't it? We also learned that Adamski was not wild about Markser slash Mundo making predictions. Of course, there were other issues with Laura. He said he reported to Adamski the predictions of Markser, and Adamski felt she should not predict more than 30 days in advance, and even that was no good sometimes. Said that on November 8, 1954, advised him she was resigning from the board of directors of the club as she had too many outside interests and she had to eat. She said she was going to show the film The Day the Earth Stood Still around Michigan as a result of having met two men, not named. Now the second redaction in there, I believe, is Laura. I'm not sure why it would be redacted in some places but not others, but given the article on her resignation in the second issue of Vimana, it fits. We also learned the name of the two men, or the names, rather, of the two men that were unnamed in the FBI report. Laura Markser accepts opportunity to spread saucer message through Saucer Research Society. Although many in the club will miss her, Laura Markser will be leaving the DFSC for a term to accept a wider opportunity in other saucer fields. In association with Robert Chapek and Frank Clark, the Saucer Research Society was recently launched for the purpose of taking saucer research up throughout Michigan and into other state areas. It is a wonderful opportunity and one that only a qualified person such as Laura could handle. It is also timely that they will be taking the film The Day the Earth Stood Still as basic lecture material, with Laura bringing out the message within each town, which this picture undeniably upholds. Needless to state, we will miss Laura greatly. Still, she will never be far away from us. Her recent letter of resignation as vice president of the Detroit Flying Saucer Club was tabled, and the pioneering work which she has done in breaking the newspaper prejudice, in helping to get the neighborhood groups underway, 
coordinating sightings, acting as telephone counselor, etc., have built strong fibers into our foundation. We wish her all the good fortune in the world, for she is accepting a challenge which she knows is rightly intended for her. Oh, and one last thing from the FBI report about Laura. She said Adamski, in California, was her god, even admitting his earthly faults. Yikes. We'll return to Laura when we're done with the FBI. It gets a little even more strange with her. The report concludes with some reassurances that the office is not carrying on an active investigation, but rather is simply passing along information. On November 23rd, 1954, called to advise he was going to do a story on the DFSC and their activities. He inquired whether the FBI was investigating the club and was advised we could make no statement one way or another regarding the organization. It is not known the date his story will appear. The Detroit office has conducted no investigation of the DFSC and has received its information from those indicated above who are voluntarily furnishing it. No investigation of the club is contemplated at this time. The Bureau, however, apparently saw something more in all of this Detroit Flying Saucer Club nonsense. You are instructed to forward to the Bureau a memorandum or report suitable for dissemination containing the pertinent information in order that it can be disseminated by the Bureau to OSI and to the Internal Security Division of the Department of Justice. In view of the facts set forth in the referenced letter, no further investigation of this matter need be conducted by your office at this time. Hoover. Clearly, there were some concerns at some level. Next, in a message dated January 5, 1955, Special Agent in Charge McIntyre from the Detroit office reported on a meeting with a DFSB member. January 5, 1955. One who is a member of Above Club advised that twice has stated he is, quote, working in conjunction with the FBI and has been told to report to Washington, D.C. for a conference. Reportedly said he has been instructed to bring another club officer with him. When the time came to go to Washington, said it was impossible for him to go and they would do so later. Both statements were made within the past month. The Detroit office is preparing a report suitable for dissemination on this club. Immediately after January 15, 1955, will be interviewed by Detroit regarding above statements, reprimanded, and cautioned to refrain from such in the future unless advised to the contrary by the Bureau. Hoover responded, Bureau sees no reason for your office to wait until January 5, 1955 to interview. Redacted. Interview him immediately, unless there is some good reason to the contrary, in which case the Bureau should be advised. Hoover. So McIntyre got to work and interviewed the mysterious member, filing a report on January 12, 1955. Of Detroit, interviewed January 11, 1955 in Bureau car in vicinity of denied making any statement he was working with or had any connection with FBI. He claimed such allegation could have arisen as a result of questions asked during some meeting as to whether the club had furnished information to the FBI or other government agency. He replied he or the club would be willing to cooperate with anyone at any time. He was cautioned to make no representation or statement, leaving the impression he had any connection with the FBI. As to reporting to Washington, said he and another club director, were going to Washington, D.C. to present their information, quote, to the Pentagon, and they hoped to see, quote, someone in Air Force intelligence. Said they intended taking with them someone, or possibly two, who had actually cited saucers. And if they get no one to go, they will get affidavits from saucer ciders. Their purpose in going is to furnish what info they have in possession of the club on flying saucer sightings and to obtain what info they can on saucers from the government. Claimed he knew of no info they had which might affect the national defense or internal security of the U.S. He claims one of New Mexico has actually flown in a saucer from Sandia Base to New York City, the round trip requiring only 30 minutes. This is probably a reference to contactee Daniel Fry, who we'll be looking at in long form in the future. Claims saucer clubs have actually received messages from outer space, and although says he does not know, he feels they do exist, have been seen by many people, and claims he has seen them himself. He feels the purpose of contacts with Earth is limited at this time to preparing people to receive landings from outer space. He said the saucers are friendly to U.S. He said messages received indicate all planets but Earth have conquered outer space. Outer space peoples consider those on Earth the lowest form of universal existence. 
Impressed agents as being only a layman who has been carried beyond the realm of scientific fact into that of possible scientific fiction. It is requested the Bureau advise whether any attempt be made by Detroit to obtain any of the material mentioned by as being in possession of the Flying Saucer Club. This probably would require contacts with other officers of the club which might be undesirable, particularly due to the doubt existing that they could be contacted on a confidential basis. I think there's something of a charming naivete here in the Detroit folks' plan to provide info on flying saucers to Air Force intelligence and hopefully get some information from them. We're almost, but not quite, to the time when saucer aficionados would nearly universally see the U.S. Air Force as the enemy. Here, at least, we see some evidence that there were those who thought that civilian saucer organizations could and should work in tandem with the military in order to solve the mystery or prepare the public for the possibility of life on other worlds. It's safe to assume, I think, that little of that actually went on, at least in a formal, acknowledged way. Hoover's response on January 18, 1955, summed up the typical FBI response to anything that had to do with actual flying saucers. Investigation re sighting of flying saucers and information concerning the flying saucers is within the jurisdiction of the Air Force and not the Bureau. The Bureau does not desire your office to obtain from club or its members material concerning flying saucers. The information concerning material reportedly in possession of club should be referred to in the report being prepared by your office. A copy of your report should be furnished to OSI locally. Hoover. Flying saucers? Not our problem. Communist flying saucer believers? Possibly our problem. Now, when people ask the FBI about flying saucers, and the, resp- the response would usually be something along the lines of, you need to talk to the Air Force. If you ask them about flying saucer personalities, the response could be somewhat different. For example, at the same time the Bureau is taking a look at the Detroit Flying Saucer Club, a concerned citizen in California sent this letter to J. Edgar Hoover. Dear Mr. Hoover, I have met and talked with the man who wrote the book Aboard a Flying Saucer. He sounds sincere, but I am always skeptical, and I have been wondering if he could be trying to put over any propaganda. I'm president of the Palm Springs Republican Club, just by way of identification, and a number of my members heard him and would like to know if he's all right. Anything you tell me will be kept in strictest confidence. Very truly yours, Thousand Palms, California. Hoover's response was a terse masterpiece of a non-answer. Dear your letter dated February 6, 1954 has been received. Although I would like to be of service, information in FBI files is confidential and available for official use only. I would like to point out also that this bureau is strictly a fact-finding agency and does not make evaluations or draw conclusions as to the charter or integrity of any individual publication or organization. I know you will understand the reason for these rules and will not infer either that we do or that we do not have the information you desire. Sincerely yours, John Edgar Hoover, Director. Interesting, to me at least, was the note appended to the file copy of Hoover's response. Note, a board of flying saucer is not identifiable in Bureau files. It is to be noted that correspondent did not furnish its author's name. Per call to Library of Congress, a board of flying saucer was written by Truman Bethram. In June 1954, an inquiry was made by the Cincinnati office concerning Bethram and his flying disc lectures. Since that office had received a complaint similar to the current correspondence, file 62-8394-342. No other references were located which might be identical with subject of current inquiry. So, despite the relatively ideology-light nature of Bethram's book, at least compared to Adamski, there had been other complaints about it. Like the concerns about the speakers brought into the Detroit Flying Saucer Club or about its leadership, the content was not, at least to our eyes and ears here in the second decade of the 21st century, overtly un-American. But it was a different time. When people ask me why the contactees concealed their political and social messages and stories about flying saucers, which is one of the things I argue that they were doing, I point to evidence like these FBI files. When you're talking up the golden rule and that's getting you noticed by your fellow citizens, you got to be careful. Speaking of ideology and contactees, we need to get back to Laura Mundo. Her first piece of flying saucer writing came out in 1956, presumably when she had finished touring The Day the Earth Stood Still around Michigan. 
it provides some confirmation that our FBI informant's report of her ideas was pretty much on the mark. It is imperative that the work of indoctrinating the people of this planet into receiving the visitors proceed without interruption. Those who are aware of the visitors and sit in meditation circles trying to contact them or attempting to bring themselves to a further awareness of self only are pursuing selfish ends and spending energy and time that should be spent towards helping their fellow man to become aware of the visitors. There is no need to contact the visitors. They know of each one of us and our efforts and are members of our saucer organizations working right along with us. Those who seek for the visitors will someday be surprised to learn that they have been right at hand all the time. They do not have time to reveal themselves to those whose only interest might prove to be the sensation of having had a contact, only to brag about it. After we've shown our good intentions of desiring to help make it possible for them to be received by everyone as one who would receive a visitor without fear or undue fanaticism, they can then openly identify themselves to everyone and visit freely amongst us and once more extend a helping brotherly hand should we need one. Well, that's comforting, isn't it? They're here, among us, in our saucer clubs. When I first read that, the first thing that jumped into my head was that Jim Mosley, a few weeks ago, was only slightly off. He had said, upon a time, that communists had infiltrated every saucer club. He was close, but it was actually the Venusians that had accomplished this. Of course, looking at it another way, perhaps the Venusians and the communists were one and the same. And what about Adamski? That FBI file reported that Mundo claimed him as her god, despite his flaws. What flaws might those have been? I worked with George Adamski for five years, knew him for nine years prior to his, quote, death in 1965. I promoted his public lectures for many years and saw him in all kinds of situations. I have written about him suddenly grabbing me and kissing me smack on the lips in the hotel suite I had arranged for him to stay in, together with other members of the first Adamski Detroit Committee in 1954, to the utter chagrin of another woman member of the committee. Another time, he accidentally put his hand on my bosom as he helped me from the car. Later, he rubbed my knee under the table with his knee when the committee and I took him out to dinner after the lecture. I could have been self-righteously offended, and there are those who would say that I was immoral if I had not been, but I had already discovered that Adamski did these things only when others were around. When he and I were alone in a hotel room, he was all business. He used more ways than one to slough off people who were so busy judging the messenger, they lost sight of the message. So Adamski's boorish harassment of Mundo was what? A test? If anyone objected to him groping her, then they were unworthy of the Space Brothers' message because they couldn't see past the behavior of their messenger? That's some pretty unhealthy ethical gymnastics going on right there. Mundo would move on from the DFSC not only to write, but also to establish a flying saucer organization called the Planetary Space Center, located in Dearborn, Michigan. The Planetary Space Center was established on June 14, 1958, and it would be closed by 1966. Soon after its closing, the Detroit Free Press did an extensive interview with Mundo. It's fascinating and a little sad, and I think it's worth taking a look at here as we finish up our second half dozen encounters. And to be honest, I'm not sure when, if ever, we'll come across Laura Mundo again. Although I gotta be honest, um, this show is the type of show where if anybody is going to find a way to work Laura Mundo into the proceedings, it's probably gonna be us. So we'll probably see her again. But if not, let's... uh, Let's see how she ends everything. Laura's entree into the saucer life was not the 1947 Kenneth Arnold sightings that kicked off the entire flying saucer subculture of the time, but rather being loaned a copy of the George Adamski Desmond Leslie book, Flying Saucers of Landon. In 1950, she divorced her husband, Otto Markser, and began a stint as a host on a local Detroit TV show, Play School, a kids' show. She was a storyteller. She would have her own sightings and received psychic contact with the Venusian visitors. As we've seen, she would serve as a sort of occasional aide-de-camp to George Adamski on his visits to Detroit, and she would author pamphlets and newsletters. But for me, the most affecting and perhaps important part of her story is what happened to the Planetary Space Center. For 11 years, the presence of Laura Mundo's Planetary Space Center at 24720 Carlisle Street in Dearborn made her neighbors uneasy. 
Laura has seen flying saucers, she says, not once, but several times. She's talked with her occupants, whom she calls the visitors, and who she says primarily are from Venus. She says Venusians are living incognito among Earth people, and she says she knows why. But all this, in the eyes of her dearborn neighbors, was not Laura's crime. It was the fact that she shared her, quote, understanding with anyone interested in listening free of charge, and for years there were lots of listeners, especially neighborhood children. That's what finally finished her on Carlisle Street. It was like a witch hunt. Young toughs began pelting Laura's house with rocks and eggs. Frightened neighbors called police and threatened to have her arrested. Anonymous telephone callers swore at her and called her a communist, an atheist, a paranoid, and worse, for two years. Wearily, reluctantly, five months ago, Laura sold the house that had been her home for 15 years and moved into a Dearborn Heights apartment, rented in the name of a friend. It's not difficult to imagine the nearly religious nature of her message was a crucial part of her difficulties in Dearborn. It's also a good reminder that despite the ubiquity of flying saucer information in the media during the 50s and 60s, enthusiastic acceptance of space visitors was rare, vanishingly rare. It's also a sobering reminder that the saucer life can be a lonely one. Laura Mundo had been an Adamski supporter and friend, but Adamski was dead by 66, and the contactee world was fading into the past. Carlisle Street in Dearborn is not the Detroit Flying Saucer Club, and the people on Carlisle Street were not living Laura Mundo's saucer life. Thanks this time, go out to the Black Vault at theblackvault.com, which is where I obtained my declassified FBI records. You can, of course, get these from the FBI directly as well. Well, that's it for Series 2, and I'd like to thank you all very much for listening. We'll be back with Series 3 beginning next week. What makes Series 3 different from Series 2? I'll tell you what's different. Subtle adjustments to audio settings that you will probably not be able to discern. That's what's different. Seriously, though, the next batch of episodes are solidly grounded in the golden age of the flying saucer life from the late 40s into the 70s. Although if you don't want to consider the 70s a golden age, I'm not going to fight you too hard. Some of the upcoming topics are ones with which you may be familiar, such as Ashtar Command. Others possibly not, such as the Borderland Science Research Associates and their Project Etheria. Encounter 206 featured Nelson Sinat as the voice of J. Edgar Hoover and Roberta Evangeline Straith as the voice of Laura Mundo. You can follow along with us at SaucerLife.com and at Twitter and Instagram at, sauc- at SaucerLife. Or you can email us at TheSaucerLife at gmail.com. If you could rate and review the show on iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, anywhere else, that's great. Sharing and retweeting of links to shows are also appreciated. If you haven't subscribed using your favorite podcast app or service, please do so. It's the easiest way to ensure you don't miss any of the action. The Saucer Life is a Chizo Media production. Until next time, keep watching the skies, because the skies are watching you. <laughs>